to Bracewood Church Wednesday night. So blessed that you came to worship with us. We're here to glorify the Lord today and praise his name. Come on, let's. Lord, we thank you, Father, for your presence. Thank you, Lord, that you are worthy to be praised. Father, we come to worship and lift your name tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Glorious. Shout it out and glory. You know, every time I lift my hands, it's because of him. It's because of you, Lord. It's because of you that we praise and shout. Hallelujah. Yeah. Come on, wherever you are, put your hands together. 
yeah, every time, every time I lift my hands is because of you. Every time I lift, every time I lift my voice is because of you. Every time I give you praise, I give you praise is because of you. Oh, every time I bless your name, every time I bless your name is because Come on, of sing you. That again. Every time I lift my hands, it's because of you. Every time I lift my voice, I lift my voice, it's because of you. Every time I give you praise, every time I give you praise, it's because of you. Every time I, every time I bless your name, it's because of you. It's because of you. It's because of you that I sing. Yeah, it's because of. Every time I lift my hands, come on. Every time I lift my hands, it's because of you. Every time I lift my voice, I lift my voice. Lord, we worship you, Father God. Lord, it's because of you that we dance, Father God. It's because of you that we sing and worship, Father. Lord, you are worthy of it all, Father God. There is no one like you, Lord. We welcome your presence in this place, Lord. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We just want to stop right here in your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of love. When my heart becomes free, 
Touch everyone online, Father, that's watching this, Lord. I pray that you would touch every heart, Lord, that needs a touch from you, Lord. May we walk away from this moment, Lord, knowing that we've touched you, Father God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Welcome to Brazewood Church Encounter Online. We continue our series tonight, Powerful Parables. And tonight, I'll be teaching on the second parable, and that is unequal debts. Unequal debts. And our text is found in Luke chapter 7. We'll be reading verse 40 through 43. And because we're talking about unequal debts or debts, allow me to share a statistic with you that, that I think will help us to relate to this parable a little bit, a little bit more. The average American has $138,000 in debt or indebtedness. $138,000 for the average American. And that includes all consumer debt products, including credit cards, personal loans, mortgages, and of course, student, student loans. $138,000 worth of debt. Now, I would imagine that would create a lot of stress on a person or a family. But just now, think for a moment, just a moment. What would it mean to you if you had $138,000 of debt and you received in the mail a letter, and as you opened it up and read the letter, it said the debt has been completely forgiven. The debt is erased. How do you think that would make you feel? This parable is not so much about forgiving the debt as it is the response to being forgiven. Just as we just you know, use that example, what would be our response if we were forgiven $138,000? We're looking at the response of people in the relationship to the parable that Jesus is teaching, trying to convey not just the story, but trying to convey a spiritual principle that runs alongside or parallel to uh, the spiritual principle that Jesus is trying to help us and, of course, the one that he's speaking to help understand. This parable revolves around three people, three individuals. And as we look, we see that their response reveals their heart. First of all, we're dealing with a woman, and she seems to be very humble. Humble. We deal with a, a man, a Pharisee, who seems to be very self-righteous. And then, of course, we deal with Jesus, who always demonstrates love and compassion, mercy and grace, and a willingness to pay a debt that he did not owe. Let's first look at the woman. She was humble. In fact, we'll see even as she approached Jesus uh, in the story before the parable, we'll see that that reflected what was in her heart. Unpretentious, she was unassuming. In fact, she knew, as, long, as well as everyone else, she knew who she was and she knew what she was. She wasn't making excuses. She wasn't trying to convince anybody of anything other than who she was. Then we look at the self-righteous man. And like most self-righteous people, he was arrogant, inconsiderate, self-centered, and most of all, prideful. And then we see Jesus. And Jesus in this parable is just like every other Jesus you will find in the Word of God. And, and really, in, in the response of the woman and the Pharisee, it really depends on whose eyes they're looking through how they will respond to Jesus. What will be their response? What will be their attitude, their personal attitude towards the Lord? You look through the eyes of the woman and you see one reaction. You look through the eyes of the, of the man in this story and there's another reaction. Let's look first at the vision of a humble person and a self-righteous person. Let's, let's draw a parallel them together and see how, how different they are. The difference between a humble person and a self-righteous person depends on who they compare themselves to. Now let me repeat that because I think that's important. It's important to us. The difference between somebody who is humble and somebody who is or becomes self-righteous is who they compare themselves to through whose eyes they see. The self-righteous person, on the one hand, compares themselves to others. 
You, you see that in, the, in, in parables of Christ and you see that in the life of the Pharisees and even the disciples at times. You see them comparing themselves to somebody else. Now typically, when people compare themselves to somebody, they always compare it to somebody who they feel is lesser than they are and that elevates them in their own eyes. It doesn't elevate them in anybody else's eyes, but it elevates them in their own eyes and that gives them the reason behind or the proof behind their attitude of self-righteousness. Now that proof is only in their own mind. It's not a reality, certainly not a spiritual context. And, and also a self-righteous person, besides comparing themselves to others, making themselves seem better, they also have an attitude where I don't need anything. I don't need anybody to tell me anything. I don't need anybody to lead me or guide me. In fact, I have the ability to tell everybody else what they ought to be doing. A humble person, on the other hand, compares themselves to Jesus. A humble person, through the eyes of a humble person, they, they look at themselves as they compare themselves to Jesus. And, and when they do that, they always find themselves needing a Savior. When you compare yourself, when you compare your life to the life of Jesus, to the Spirit of Jesus, to the person of our Messiah, Jesus Christ, you always come to the conclusion quickly, I need a Savior. I can't do this by myself. I don't want to do this by myself. I need Jesus. And then as they also look at themselves through the eyes of Christ, they recognize that they desperately need help, that they can't do it by themselves. They need someone to pay the debt in their life that they have no ability to pay. And this is the message of this parable. Let's read our text, Luke chapter, 40, chapter 7, verse 40 through 43, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. Verse 40 says, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. And then, and we'll come back to this later, and then Jesus waits. He waits for, for Simon to respond. Simon, I have something to tell you. Simon said, tell me, teacher. In other words, there, there was an interaction between Jesus and, and Simon. Jesus was saying, Simon, I have something to tell you. Are you willing to hear me? Verse 41 says, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other owed him 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, here's the question. Now, which of them loved him more? Simon replied, I suppose, and there's a key word there, reveals the heart. I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. What a response. What a, what a response to a sincere question. I suppose. Now, to understand this parable and its completeness, we've got to know the context. In fact, of every parable, you need to know the context. So let's look at the context. And we find that in Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 40. First of all, we find that Jesus accepts an invitation to eat at a Pharisee's house. Now, this wasn't the first time, and he had done this before, and he would do it again. He would have an invitation, and he would be willing to accept that invitation. Oft times, the invitation was not... Uh, out of humility. The invitation was not out of courtesy. The invitation was often out of a desire to make Jesus look bad, to trick him or to cause him to stumble almost every time. Now, we don't know the motive of, of Simon. We don't know whether he was trying to impress others by having Jesus in his home. We just really don't know. And, and what we also need to glean from this is that this is not Simon Peter. Uh, there, Simon was a very common name in Jesus' day, and, and I, I think some might presume this was Peter's home that Jesus was invited to, but it wasn't. It was, it was Simon the Pharisee, and that brings us to the second point, and that is he was a Pharisee. And typically, being a Pharisee, those that encountered Jesus at least, he was legalistic and he was hypocritical. In other words, we could say he was self-righteous. Now, here's what's interesting in this story. It becomes important later on after the parable. Simon did not provide the common courtesies of inviting Jesus into his home. Jesus was an honored guest. But as an honored guest, there would be certain things that Simon would be required or expected to do. He invited Jesus. Jesus didn't just presume or, or invite himself to Simon's house. Simon gave the invitation. And Jesus responded. But here's what Simon did not do. Common courtesies, expected. Jesus, Simon did not wash Jesus' feet. And you can only imagine as, as traveling and, and the mode of transportation by and large was walking, that the feet would become dusty. 
or dirty and entering into one's home, it would be a common courtesy to have their feet washed. Simon didn't do it. The other thing was to anoint with oil. This would be a provision of respect to one who comes into your home. And then thirdly, a kiss of reverence or subjection often, again, would be a common courtesy of inviting a special guest into your home. And Simon did none of these things. In fact, by not doing it, it would have been an insult. It would have been a sense of rejection. Simon would have been conveying to Jesus an attitude. And the attitude was, I don't acknowledge your position, Jesus. I don't know who you are. Well, the question would be, why did he invite Jesus to his home in the first place? One might presume that it had more to do with Simon's position in the community that he would invite this important man into his home and, and the man would say yes, or that Simon really didn't care one way or another. But nonetheless, he did not provide those common courtesies and that would have been considered in Jesus' day, that would have been considered a tremendous insult. Now, also in the context, we look at the woman and you see that they, they are diametrically opposed. They are 180 degrees different in attitude. The woman, the Bible says, lived a sinful life, and perhaps it's presumed that she could have been or might have been a prostitute. Now, look at this picture. You have Jesus, holy, righteous, sinless, next to a prostitute. And, and what we see here in the context is that this sinful woman's attitude towards Jesus or encounter with Christ was completely different than Simon's encounter. And remember, and this is very important, she was not an invited guest. She was not invited. Simon never would have invited her into his home. It would have been considered a tremendous um, uh, harm to his reputation to even associate with somebody like this woman. And so we would imagine that she probably snuck into the home and probably stayed into the corner and in, in the darkness or behind a, a door so that she wouldn't be observed. And if she was observed, she would have fully expected to have been thrown out of the house. And she brings with her an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. Now, remember, Simon didn't. She stands behind Jesus weeping. Not just weeping in the context of little tears coming down her cheek, but perhaps in the context of bitterness, bitterly weeping. And she stands behind Jesus. And, and I, I think perhaps she stood behind Jesus because she wasn't sure, wasn't totally convinced whether Jesus would accept her. Would he respond to her like Simon would have responded to her? Would he respond to her like everyone else would have responded because of her sinfulness? So she stands behind Jesus to begin with and begins to weep. Now, don't you know that when somebody stands behind you, you, you are aware. Typically, you're aware that somebody is near you or close to you. And I'm sure, I'm sure Jesus knew that she was there. And because he didn't respond, perhaps, she felt a little more boldness than to not just be behind him, but to approach him. She does not feel worthy to approach Simon, uh, approach Jesus, excuse me. She does not feel worthy to approach Jesus. Now compare that or contrast that with Simon. Simon goes up to Jesus, talks to Jesus, invites Jesus into his home, and then insults him. Now, when she finally comes around to approach Jesus and he does not respond to her as other people would have, she begins to wash his feet with her tears. She must have really been crying, weeping, weeping. And she washed his feet with her tears. And then you talk about a, an act of submission, an act of humility. She washes his feet with her tears and then dries his feet with her hair. What a, what, what a personal act, what an intimate act of, of love, of humility. But not Simon. Simon didn't even have one of his servants wash Jesus' feet. Finally, if that weren't enough, what a, a scene that must have been. To anyone whose heart was least bit compassionate, it would have been a touching moment. But then she kisses his feet and anoints them with fragrant oil. She kisses his feet. You know, that is a major sign, a, a significant sign of subjection to or submissiveness to an individual to kiss their feet. And, and again, she had washed her, his feet, 
but feet aren't always the most clean, cleanly, cleansy, clean part of the body. And yet she condescended. Simon wouldn't kiss Jesus on the cheek. She kissed his feet. So you see the contrast between these two characters and, and the contrast of their response to Jesus really reveals what's in their heart. And then finally, in the context of this parable, Simon then begins to wonder, could Jesus truly be a prophet? If he knew the kind of person that she was, and it was obvious, the way she was dressed, her demeanor, perhaps even the smell, would have given away that she was a, a sinner. And Jesus allowed her to do it. And there was a reason for that that is later said in the scriptures. And so Simon wondering, why would Jesus allow this to happen? Why wasn't he absolutely offended with her response to Christ? He wondered, is this, is this man really a prophet? Is this man really a teacher? So now again, you see the attitude in the heart of Simon. Now, knowing what is in the Pharisee's heart, Jesus offers to say something to him. Again, reaching out. Here's the love and the compassion of Jesus Christ, that there's a man who has insulted him, grievously offended him or desired to, and Jesus reaches out to him not to condemn him, not to rebuke him, but this whole parable is speaking to Simon. And again, I think it's that attitude of bringing Simon into a relationship with Jesus to answer his inquisitive spirit that I am who you think I am. In fact, I am the Messiah. Now, all of this is background to the parable. So, as we look at the parable of the unequal debts, we see, first of all, that Jesus noticed what Simon overlooked. Jesus took notice of the fact that Simon did not wash his feet. Jesus noticed that Simon provided no oil anointing oil as respect, and, and Jesus noticed that Simon did not kiss in a reverent welcome, an intimate welcome into one's home. Jesus noticed that. And, and Jesus now speaks and tells Simon this parable. Notice, he wasn't speaking to the woman. This parable is not directed to the woman. This parable is directed to Simon, the Pharisee. Verse 40 says, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. And then he waits. Jesus is waiting for a response. I, su I suggest to you that if Simon had not responded in a way that would have, have allowed Jesus to continue, it would have been over. The, the context, the conversation would have been over. Because at that point, Simon would not have been willing to hear what Jesus had to say. I'm not sure he was anyway. But his response, Simon's response was, tell me, teacher. Now, even though he was self-righteous, even though he was a Pharisee, even though he disrespected Jesus, Jesus still cared about Simon still was reaching out to him, endeavoring to bring him into that relationship. Now, I want to, I want to make a statement here before we delve into the, the ramifications and the intricacies of this, of this parable. Self-righteousness will always cause blindness. Self-righteousness will always cause blindness. Spiritual blindness relational blindness, emotional blindness, and yes, even sometimes physical blindness. Not physical blindness in the context of not being able to see, but physical context in the lenses that we see through. The woman knew or felt that she knew who Jesus was. Simon didn't have a clue and then questioned it after Jesus had an encounter with this woman. Matthew chapter 7 verse 5 tells us of the blindness that comes with self-righteousness. Jesus says, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You see the context here? Self-righteousness causes blindness. And, and what's interesting is often people of discerning spirit can tell when somebody has a self-righteous attitude, but the person themselves has no clue that their attitude or that their heart is self-righteous. So as we look at the parable of the unequal debts, the second thing we find is that there are two debtors. Not one, two debtors. Verse 41 says two people owed money. One owed 500 denarii and the other owned, owed 50 denarii. Two people owed money. Now, they were both debtors. Both owed, owed something to the money lender. And in the eyes of the money lender, and again, this is important in the context of this parable, unequal debts, in the eyes of the money lender, both of them held the same title. Whether it was 50 denaro or 500 denarii, they both had the same title in the eyes of the money lender, and that their title was debtor. 
Regardless of the amount of the debt, they were both debtors. Now, as we look at contrast between the woman and Simon, we might uh, derive from that that Simon probably didn't consider himself a debtor. But the woman knew that she was, and she was deeply indebted to Jesus. And the only thing that made them different, the only thing that made these two debtors of our parable different is the amount of the debt. That was the only thing. The only thing that separated them from one another, separated the context of who they were or considered to be, was the amount of the debt. Now, in the economy of the dairy, the denarii was worth, in Jesus' day, about a day's wage. Now, I want us to draw. One owed 180... I'll come to tell you that in just a minute. I jumped ahead. One owed a day's wage. The other owed a day's wage. Now, let's presume that one of them was wealthy. or And he or she, perhaps, uh, their daily wage was a considerable amount of money. The other, maybe a more common um, occupation, that their um, income was a day's wage was very much less than that. But what's interesting is, because it was a day's wage, it was equally important to them. The one with 500 denarii debt, their daily wage was, was necessary. They had to have that to survive. The one that had less debt had to have that to survive. It was a day's wage. And if we were to compare it to day, today's economy, a denarius would be worth about $3.62. So, the one who owed 500 denarii owed $1,810. And the one who owed 50 denarii owed $181. Now, if we look at those two amounts together, we would see that there's quite a bit of difference there. $1,810 versus $181. But regardless of the amount that was owed, their titles were the same. They were both debtors. And, and before salvation, and this is the spiritual that we glean from this, before salvation, we all have the same title. All of humanity has the same title before forgiveness, before our relationship with Christ. And, the, and that title? Sinner. Some of us sinned greatly and grievously, and, and others of us lived, lived very um, good lives, very moral lives, uh, very upstanding, upright lives. We're still called a sinner. And, and the person who you would presume had the worst life, the most despicable life on the face of the earth, who committed more grievous sin than anyone else, had the same title. Sinner. The Bible says we, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So in the money lender's eyes, both of them, regardless of the amount, both of them were debtors. And the only thing that made them different is the amount of debt that they owed. Me, before I came to Jesus, I had a tremendous debt that I could not pay. In fact, if it was $1,810, it might as well have been $18 billion. I had no capacity to pay my spiritual debt. As we look at the parable of the unequal debts, thirdly, we find that neither of them could pay. And in that, they were equal as well. They were, had equal title, debtor, and neither of them could pay. In every respect, except for the amount, they were equal. Verse 42 tells us neither of them had the money to pay him back. They were both debtors, and neither of them could pay the debt that they owed. And regardless of what was owed, the amount, they were both in the same condition. They both would have found themselves in the same condition. Can I tell you? Sin leaves all of humanity in the same condition. Same title, sinner, same condition, lost. Lost and in need of a Savior. And it doesn't matter the person's wealth. It doesn't matter their position. It doesn't matter their background. It doesn't matter how much education they have. In fact, it doesn't even matter if they're the most powerful person that walks on the face of the earth in their lifetime. It doesn't matter. They all are lost. Everyone, every one of us, before we came to Jesus, we were lost. We were all in the same condition. No one could say they were better than somebody else in the eyes of Jesus. We were all the same. We were all lost, and we all had a need for a Savior. As we look at the parable of the unequal debts, we also see, number four, that only the money lender could cancel the debt. Only the money lender could cancel the debt. They couldn't do it themselves. They couldn't, they couldn't look to somebody else to do it. 
they couldn't take out another loan to pay off that debt. Nobody would loan them something when they already owed what they couldn't pay. It was something they could not do for themselves. And how utter helpless a person feels when there's something that needs to be done in your life and you can't do it yourself. Verse 42 tells us neither of them had the money to pay him back. And what was the money lender's response? He had the right to demand the money. In fact, he had the right to place them in a, in a sense of, of, of enslavement to pay off that debt and to be, to be committed to the money lender until the debt was paid. But what did he do? He forgave them the debts. And he forgave both of them. That's interesting to me. It, it, you might presume that, well, you know, I, I'll forgive the $180. After all, I can, I can live without that. But the $1,800? No, I've got to have that. No. He forgave them equally. They were, they were unequal amounts, but they were both debts, and they were both forgiven. Large debt forgiven, small debt forgiven. How much sin in our life, I would ask you, is destructive? And how much sin in our life separates us from God? The desire of the Father is to forgive us. They could not pay, so they both had to rely on the compassion of the moneylender. Now, here's the truth. God released us from the debt of death. We, were, we owed a debt we couldn't pay, and He released us. And the debt was a debt of death, an emotional death, a spiritual death, and an even physical death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. That's the consequence of sin always. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of God is life worth living. He released us from the debt of death. And God released us from the debt of death because He is faithful and righteous. Not because they were worthy or they had earned the right to be forgiven. They couldn't pay. But because He was faithful. Because He was righteous. He was right in his response to those whom he loved. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God released us from the debt of death because he is faithful and righteous, not because we could pay our own debt. We couldn't do it. We can't do it. And it's about time we stop trying to do it. Titus 3, 5 says, He saved us not because of the righteous things that we had done, or our ability to save ourselves, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And then we come fifthly to the question. Pivotal point now in the parable, the question. The question that Jesus posed to Simon was this, who loved him more? It's a very, very simple question. Verse 42 and 43 says, Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debt of both of them. Now, who of them will love him more? And verse 43 says, Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Now, I wonder, I wonder how he said that. Of course, we don't know. But I wonder if he didn't say it offhandedly, kind of in a condescending attitude. Well, I suppose it was the one forgiven the greater debt. And though, in other words, uh, yeah, I know what you're trying to get at, Jesus. Uh, and you're asking me such a silly question. Don't you know I'm a Pharisee? Don't you know I'm educated? Don't you know who I am? And then you would ask me this silly question. I suppose. And Jesus said, you've, you've judged correctly. Can I just tell you? I wouldn't have to study the question. I wouldn't have to go back and reread the parable to answer the question, who loved him more? It, it is obvious to anyone who has any sensitivity it is obvious to anyone who has any, any heart and compassion, it is obvious the answer is the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. It's obvious, Jesus. I get it. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if that would have been Simon's response? I get it, Jesus. I get it. I know who I am now. And Jesus' response to Simon was, you have judged correctly. Now remember here, that earlier Simon had questioned Jesus, questioned his calling, questioned whether he was a prophet, because he was kind to the sinner. Simon never would have been kind to the sinner. In fact, again, we presume that she had to sneak into the home. Otherwise, he would have sent her out. He would have thrown her out unceremoniously. He questioned who Jesus was. He questioned Jesus' life. John Mark Green said, The self-righteous screen judgments against others to hide the noise of skeletons dancing in their own closets, often pointing out the faults of others, 
And at the same time that they point out the faults of other, they're simply pointing out the faults that are in their life. And it's to guise or veil their own unrighteousness in their own eyes and in the eyes of others. And though the sinful woman may have owed more, the self-righteous Pharisee was just as sinful as she was. And I want you to hear this. Great gratitude of the heart came as a result of recognizing the depth of forgiveness. I want to say that again. Great gratitude of the heart came as a result of recognizing the depth of forgiveness. She knew who she was. Simon didn't have a clue who he was. She knew where she had come from. She knew what she had done. She knew the depravity of her own life. Simon did not have a clue because self-righteousness will always cause blindness. That's what self-righteous will always do. Recognizing the size of our debt. Now we're talking personally to, to ourselves. Recognizing the size of our debt forgiven will keep us humble. It will keep us humble before the one who forgave us the debt, Jesus. But it will also keep us humble towards one another. And when we find that, when we come to that point where we recognize the size of the debt that has been forgiven, the, the amount of sin in our life that has been forgiven, then the response is obvious. Not, I suppose, but we begin to rejoice in our debt forgiven. Thinking again, as we begin this, if somebody eradicated all of your debt, how would you respond? It wouldn't be, oh, well, okay, I guess I deserve, I earned that. No, it would be joy. In fact, 1 Peter says, 1 Peter 1.8 says, You love him though you have not seen him. And though not seeing him now, you believe in him and rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy. King James Version says, joy unspeakable. And there's a song that we used to sing when I was growing up. It's joy unspeakable and full of glory. Full of glory, full of glory. It's joy unspeakable and full of glory. And the half has never yet been told. If we recognize and continuously recognize the depth to which we have had been, the debt of our life, and the fact that with a simple prayer and a transformation of life, all of the debt was removed completely. And in the end, in the end, it was the woman who was forgiven. In the end, it was the one who was considered by everyone to be the worst of sinners. She was forgiven. In verse 47, the Bible says, Therefore I tell you, and he's talking to Simon, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then he turned to the woman and he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. What do you think her response would have been? She wasn't a refined woman. I suspect she probably grinned from ear to ear, probably shouting and dancing, making a, a real spectacle of herself because something had just happened. She was a debtor who had been released from her debt. Notice he said nothing to Simon. He, he offered no forgiveness because self-righteousness would not allow Simon to seek forgiveness. He didn't need forgiveness. He didn't need anything from Jesus. So, in the parable of the unequal debts, what is our challenge? Number one, we must recognize that Jesus knows our debts. Jesus knows our life. You can't hide, you can't pretend, and self-righteousness is nothing. In fact, the Bible says it's a stench in the nostrils of God. Secondly, our challenge, we must recognize that we are all debtors. We are all in the same boat. God is no respecter of persons. In God's eyes, we are all His children and we are all loved by God. doesn't matter what titles we hold. doesn't matter what power we have. We are all loved by God equally. And we must come to the realization that I am a debtor. We must come to the realization that I am a debtor and I confess my need to be forgiven of that debt that I can't pay. And that leads us to the third point of our challenge. We must recognize we cannot pay our debts. We cannot do enough to compensate for the sin of our life. And, and by the way, let me just speak frankly to you in this moment. Stop trying to earn God's forgiveness. It's not by works of righteousness. Stop trying to earn God's love. He's already offered forgiveness, canceling the debt, and He has already offered His love to you. What is our challenge? Number four, we must recognize that only the money lender can cancel the debt. Only Jesus can forgive us. 
only forgiven through Jesus Christ. No other way. There's no other way to the Father except through Jesus himself. Not good works, not giving our life, not giving our money, and not following a set or list of rules, but going to the money lender, going to the, the one who holds the debt, and coming to him and asking him, here's my bill of sale. Father, forgive me. And stamping on that invoice, paid in full. Praise the Lord. Paid in full. Only the money lender could cancel a debt. And what is our challenge finally? We must begin and learn to celebrate our debt forgiven for the rest of our lives. Not just be happy in that moment. Perhaps when you were saved, there were tears. At the beginning, tears of repentance, tears of sorrow, bitter tears. But after you accepted that forgiveness, after the debt was canceled, there were tears of joy. And I believe we ought to revel in that debt forgiveness for the rest of our lives. To remember what we owed and to remember what He forgave. Great gratitude of the heart comes as a result of recognizing the depth of our forgiveness and then celebrating. Heavenly Father, thank you for this story, this parable that teaches us an attitude of two people, contrasting a woman who was sinful in every way, recognized her sin and was known for her sin, and the self-righteous Pharisee who thought he had it all together. But in this parable, they both recognized they were equal debtors. They could not pay their debt. Neither can we pay our debt of sin. But Jesus came to ransom us. Jesus came to pay that ransom and to settle that score. Debt is completed. Debt canceled. And I pray, Father, that we will realize that and rejoice in the fact that we are forgiven by and because of your mercy and grace and your righteousness. And Father, if we are not in that personal relationship with you, then we come to you as the woman did. And we say, Father, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my past. Cancel my debt that I don't have the ability to pay. And with a sincere prayer, Father, and we ask you, you will forgive that debt. You will cancel that debt completely. Whether it's a debt of a billion dollars or a debt of two dollars of sin, you will cancel that debt. And only you, Father, only you can cancel the debt of our sin. And we receive that with joy and righteousness, with thanksgiving. And Father, I also pray that you cleanse us. If there be a self-righteous attitude or even a seed of self-righteousness, that you would cleanse us of it and bring us to that place of rejoicing in the forgiveness that you have provided. Freely you have received, so freely give. We thank you for it and rejoice in our debt forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Your debts are forgiven in Jesus' name. It's time to receive the Lord's tithes and offerings. Again, I want to thank you for your faithfulness, your stewardship. God has blessed you, and as a result of His blessing in your life and your faithfulness to Him, you have blessed the church. Our text, our theme is releasing your blessing. That's God's desire. We're going to see that here in just a moment. If you've ever wondered, God's desire is to bless your life. We have the ability to release that blessing in God's will. Psalms chapter 115 verse 12 is our scripture. But, but I want you to understand, and I hope you do, that God is passionate about blessing his children. He is passionate. He is committed to blessing his children. And an earthly father desires to give good gifts to his children. How much more our Father in heaven desires to give good gifts. And don't you know when God gives a gift, it's not only a good gift, it's the best gift to those who are his children. If you ever wondered if God wants to bless you, Put your mind at ease. Psalms 115 verse 12, very simple scripture. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. I want to, want to read that again. The Lord is mindful of us. He will bless us. That wasn't a question. That wasn't even a, 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 a request. It was a statement of fact. He will bless us. In the Easy Read Version, it says, The Lord remembers us. And in the Living Bible, it says, Jehovah is constantly thinking about us. I love that. I love the fact that God loves me so much, He can't get me off of His mind. He's, he, he's always constantly thinking about us. And in the context of thinking about He's not thinking about us because we owe a debt. We've been relieved of our debts. He's not thinking about us, looking for us to fail. He loves us. 
He loves us with an everlasting love. He is constantly thinking about us because He loves us. Each new day brings with it a blessing. Each new day. Now, I believe there are, the day is filled with the blessings of the Lord, but each day begins with a blessing. You know what that is? You woke up to a new day of spiritual adventures. That's the first blessing. You were able to awaken. And you woke up and you know that today is going to be an adventurous day, a spiritual adventure, a quest to see the goodness of God, to walk in the favor of God and to receive the blessings of the Lord and to love Him and to obey Him. So my word of encouragement to you today is this. Trust God. He's thinking about you. He's constantly thinking about you. Let your mind be on Him. Meditate on His word. Trust God. Obey His word with joy, with thanksgiving, with celebration, and present your tithes and offerings to the Lord. It is a presentation. It is a presentation of our trust, our trust in God. And as we present our tithes and offerings, as we declare our trust, as we obey God's word with joy and with thanksgiving, we are releasing the blessing that God has already released into our life. So my word to you today is release your blessings in Jesus' name. Now. Two things I want to share with you. Number one, relax. Your debts are forgiven. <laughs> your debts are eradicated. Relax. God is in control of every detail of your life. So we have the ability not to worry, not to fret, not to have anxiety live in our life, but to relax because God is in control. And then Don and I love you. We love you. We pray for you. We look forward to seeing you. We're calling Sunday services at Branch Forest and Fondren and Hispanic Campus as family worship. Bring your children, bring the student, bring the entire family into the service. We have social distancing. It's, it's as safe as any place you would go, including your children going to school already. Uh, come back to worship. Come back as a family. And we have designed and working hard to make it a family experience. So I would look forward to seeing you and your children. In fact, last Sunday we had more children and more students than we've had since we opened the church or reopened the church. And I'm looking for that to grow and to expand. I love seeing your children. I love seeing our students. And I love seeing you. And we look forward to seeing you very soon. So finally, take two minutes, please, two minutes to watch the upcoming events here at Braisewood and a special announcement. Don't, don't stop. There are some things that you need to know, some exciting things coming at Braisewood, and we want you to be aware. God bless you. We love you. And we'll look forward to seeing you Sunday. In Jesus' name. Hello, Braisewood. Uh, my name is Chris Hudson. I'm a deacon here at Braisewood Church. Each year we take a time, and typically that's in September or October, that we bring honor and appreciate our pastors. This is an important event, and as you know, it's always good to give thanks, especially to those who serve us in the name of the Lord. As you know, COVID-19 has interrupted some of our plans, disrupted some of the activities. It's prevented our pastors from having the one-to-one -one relationship that they enjoy and we, we count on each year. But they have done their very best. They have strived each year, and during the year, and during the months that we've been through this, this pandemic, they've been looking for ways to reach us, to speak with us, through video, through online messaging. Our youth and children's pastors have hosted special videos, bringing us together, keeping us together as a body of Christ. And so this year we've chosen the month of December, but we want to give them a generous love offering, saying thanks, it's been difficult, it's been hard for everyone, but again, it's important to give thanks to those who serve us. You'll have an opportunity to do that online. It'll be one of the choices you can make on the app. For those who have been attending our services in person, you can give. There's usually a blue envelope that will be available to you. And certainly, feel free to mail a check to the church. Just note that it's for pastor's appreciation. I thank you very much. I, I'm very appreciative of serving you as a deacon. And I pray that you will reach out once again with your heart and with your donation to make this a special time of appreciation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.